Are you ready for a story? Yeah! Yeah! yeah. Story! <coughs> so the nine other men had to leave with 300 men each and to carry the heavy weight of reanimating something. And so the listener left them and he walked a long way with the woman he was with and they talked about this and they talked about that but deep down in his belly the listener knew something about this woman he thought he loved. And at a certain point when they got to a swamp, he looked at her and said, you don't really appear to be a woman. From what I've seen of your sisters and your mother, you are some other contrary creature hanging between this world and the other world. How do you marry a woman like that? And she said, well, you may be true. But I told you I had one piece of advice for you, and I am now going to give it. I sense our roads are about to diverge, and you're going to go into some other part of your life, young man. But know this. On the road you are heading on, there will come a day where blocking it is another longhouse. And to get to where you need to go, you need to walk through that longhouse. But it is full of women. And if you look to the left, or to the right, or to anything other than straight ahead, you will fall into deep misfortune. And this is my final piece of advice for you. And with that, she turned into a duck. A duck! D-U-C-K! To the Seneca Indians, the duck is a very sacred thing. If you think about a duck, it can survive in the air, and in the water, and on land. And as he saw the duck waddle into the twilight of the swamp, he thought maybe it was uh, a good idea I didn't marry her. You ever married a duck? Many years pass for the listener. And the old storytellers will tell you that wherever he went, the game was bountiful. The animals came to his bow. The animals came to his spear. If he came into a village, people celebrate him. They were pleased to see him. The drinks were brought for him. He was raised in rank. He was having a very good time. Such a good time. Maybe the advice of that woman that became a duck got lost somewhere in his head and long houses full of women. And I, I'm not sure about this. Past the Shiraz. Glug, 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 glug. This could go on a long time in our lives. Could be 30, could be 40, could be 50, could be 60. It was a long time and he had a, a little belly on him and he was swelled. I mean, has he not had much success? Has he not outwitted a witch? Has he not reanimated a pile of bones? Has he not led men? Much grandiosity hanger hung off him. But then one day he did indeed find himself wandering again on that track. And this time the lane he was on, he did not meet men and women coming this way and that. He did not meet men and women celebrating him or singing the songs of the listener. What he saw ahead was a longhouse. And at the back of his head he remembered these words. Do not look left, do not look right. Go in the entrance, walk through to the other side, and maybe you'll live. So with what courage he had, and what incantations he had hidden in his belly and his heart and his guts. He came into the entrance and he started to dance into the dark. And immediately he did. He felt voices whispering from this side and that side. Hey, look at me. You, one that we have waited for. Come, see, make your place amongst us many women. We hold many secrets, many delights. 
Look at the curl of your hair, the twinkle of your eye. Just look at me for a second, please, sweet one. Bright pulse of the morning. Man, some of them were Irish. And he was almost through it, wasn't he? You were almost through it. You could see the light ahead of you. You were almost clear. And then suddenly, there's that one voice we can't quite resist. Just look at me. Just look at me. It'll only take a second. And at that second, he turned to the left and he saw a woman standing there in a buckskin cloak made entirely of men's eyes. And at that moment, his eyes jumped from his head, scuttled down his body, scuttled along the floor and onto the buckskin robe. This great man was suddenly on all fours, taken this way and that way and thrown out of the lodge back into the forest. A buckskin robe made entirely of men's eyes. When did your eyes fall out of your head, scuttle along the floor and land on a woman's cloak? Had you been unlucky enough over the following years to see this man, you would never have guessed he was the hero from earlier on in the story. All he could eat was leaves, his hunting abilities was lost, he drank from cold streams, and the old storytellers say, one by one, the trees and the bushes that had once been his friend started to pull his clothes off till he was naked and burnt and lost and confused, just like Parsifal. Just like Finn McCool when he lost the love of his life. Just like many of us. That wonderful head of hair of his was now full of streaks of grey and silver. His belly was stuck to his ribs. And the only way he had any way of knowing where he was was by listening still. And he knew if the birds were chirruping, day was coming. He knew if they went silent, night was coming. And with the most terrible nightmares. The first part of his life seemed now like some distant dream. No animal brought him food. No animal laid down their life. There was not the hustle and bustle and the praise of the pub or the bar or the feasting hall. He was utterly alone. Until one day, reaching out like this, the blind man, what was left of him was like a small sprig at the edge of the forest. He reached out and he could feel corn, stem of corn. And he reached out and he could feel another. And he knew it was a field. He knew it was something that had been planted deliberately. And have you ever placed your hand on a field of corn, moving this way and that, so gentle? And he decided, I don't know who or what has made this field, but I'm going to sit next to it. The storytellers say, I'm going to make myself visible. And the strange man, with no eyes and the scrawny naked body, sat in the heat of the sun and waited by this enormous field of corn. And at a certain point, a beautiful young woman arrived, the maiden of the corn, the one who, who has plowed and grown and seeded this field. And she saw him, this once great man, and you know what he said? Would you have any need for a scarecrow? Because I can see, I can see I'm a freak. I can see you'd never look at me as a husband. But, but I would scare the birds away. I would scare the birds away. Could I do that? And she looked at him and said, I better get my mother. Now, her mother was not like the mother at the back of the canoe. 
There are many mothers. This mother was what you would call maybe a crone rather than a witch. One with steely eyes, but a wide smile and wrinkles in just the right places and a sash of hair down her back. And as soon as she saw him, she said, this man must have gone through the hut where the women take the eyes. They know about this place. And the old woman and the maiden of the corn, they cleaned him and they washed him. And indeed, he did live as a scarecrow. He stood there and the birds would stay away and he'd waggle his arms this way and that. Some figure of fun almost. But they fed him and they fed him. And gradually strength came back to him. So much so, one day he heard from the side of the woods the sound of something moving. He wasn't sure what it was, but it sounded like it could be the footfall of a young deer. And he said, get your mother. Do you have a bow and arrow? Do you have a bow and arrow? And the old crone said, I have a smoky bow and one crooked arrow. I don't know what a smoky bow is, but I love the idea. They reached down and they brought him this smoky bow and an arrow that could not fly straight. And so following a crooked smoky path, the blind man, reduced from all his former status, the blind man with the crooked arrow, just listened and listened and listened and shh. That deer lay down and gave its life. And as it did it, some sweet inspiration came to his head and he said, quick, bring me the deer, bring me the deer. And they brought the deer to him and he, he said, cut out the eyes. Cut out the eyes of the deer. And he placed the eyes of the deer in the empty burnt sockets of his own. And he could see again. But he couldn't see how you or I can see. He saw the whole world, the whole universe, the whole stars through the eyes of the deer. Not a vision that you or I would find easy. It's not comfortable to hold the eyes of a deer in your head. But sometimes we have to borrow vision. And the animal powers are the best mentors we've got. So time passed, and every two or three weeks, he would start to go blind again. And every two or three weeks, he would have to take himself to the edge of the forest with the smoky bow and the one crooked arrow. And the man with fading vision would shoot the arrow up through the air. And this time it may be an elk, or a fox, or a raven. And gradually, he would see the world, he would see his place in the world through all of these animal powers. At some point, he became close to the maiden of the corn and she became close to him. And you can see them at dusk sitting by the side of the field, talking to each other, whispering. Until with what vision he had, he said, you are, you are more tuneful than the fiddle. You are more tuneful than the fiddle. And when I heard you, and when I saw you, I swear I thought the moon herself had fallen into a field of wild flowers and was singing a song I had waited my whole life to hear. I love you, and I want to marry you. She went back to the old crone. The old crone looked this way and that way and said, well, his eyes look dubious, but I'd go right ahead. <laughs> so there was indeed a great wedding, as great as you can have on the side of a field when there's nobody there but the animals. But the animals gathered, and the, ma the man and the woman gathered, and the old woman. And for a while there was contentment, until the day that the young woman came to him and said, I think I'm pregnant. And that, for now, is where we shall leave them. So a lot just happened. Let's feed it a little bit.
Take yourself through it. Where are you? It's not where you would have predicted the story was going to go at the beginning, would you? He's had such a wonderful education. He's your sort of dream boy shaman character. And still it's saying, you know, maybe they, he just had that one moment of what a good boy am I. You know, that time, those middle years where he celebrated for the actions of youth. Yeah. Any more minutes, moments? First time when he put on the deer's eyes, he could see the whole world in a different way. Finding the stalks of corn. Yeah. Have you ever got lost in a forest and suddenly found a, a track, like a, a track you can get, and you're just crying with gratitude? Yeah. You've, never, you've never loved tarmac as much. <laughs> so this, I've been working in maximum security prisons recently, uh, and I've been working with the sex offenders, uh, you know, the paedophiles and, and the, the really edgy end of the game and also with what we call in England the main wing. So, you know, sort of career criminals. and They love this story. Uh, and they specifically love the moment where the eyes fall out of the head. Uh, and we've had a lot of interesting times saying, you know, what caused your eyes to fall out of your head? And you know, for a lot of them, sexually, porn did it. Porn did it. Their sexual imagination was, is, was frozen. Uh, and it caused their eyes to fall right out of their head. What caused, you know, have you been in that doorway? Have you looked over? What caused it to fall out of your head, your face? Where are you, Danny? I think that uh, there's something marvelous about his willingness to be the scarecrow. Yeah. And there's a certain recognition of what, what our actual condition is. Mm. You know, he doesn't say, uh, I know I don't look like it, but I am the wonderful, marvelous listener. Mm. And uh, you, may have heard you may have heard of me. Have you got my book? And, and, <laughs> you know, you, know uh, you, you hear people do this. You say, oh, I, I know I don't look like it, but 20 years ago... Uh, I, I could have been a contender. I did, <laughs> I did this, and I did this, and I did this. I have these newspaper clippings. Would you like to see them? <laughs> and, and uh uh, you know, there's an avoidance of the actual condition, the recognition of the actual soul condition. Mm. And when he says, uh, do you need a scarecrow? If I could be a scarecrow. Remember in the beginning he said, I could be a great hunter. Mm. And now suddenly he's saying, I could be a scarecrow. And humility. Yeah. 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 The, the moment when he comes out of the wild. Yeah. And he feels cultivation. Mm. You know, it's it's almost as to be part of the cultivated world, he has to start as a scarecrow. Yeah. yeah. So, and you know, uh, since I'm so fascinated with the wild and live so much, that that moment. You know, when I have to re-appreciate proper cultivation and proper, you know, proper balance between wild and, uh, and cultivated. Mm. And he, he stands there as the scarecrow, you know, to, uh, you know, to scare the wild away so that the cultivation can continue. Mm. Mm. But it's not a complete mm. dismissal of the wild. No. No. Yeah. So he's at that, at that point in between, and he's upright. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's also worth noting that he's not in a village. No. You know, these two women live alone on the edge of the forest, and they have a little patch of cultivation. And this is the measure of his aspiration at this point in his life. Mm. Mm. I think there's a thing too that from his earlier life into the scarecrow, there's both this element of protection, yeah. but in vastly different manner. But still, as a scarecrow, he's either trying or offering this manner in which he can protect yeah. something around his shoulder. Protect your shoulder just a corner of the shoulder. Yeah. Tell me if I'm going the wrong way here. I'm seeing him learning from the women. 
Right. So it's, the obvious thing is kind of he sees the dress and you know, yeah. well done that. But there's also the, there's something to be learned there. Mm -hmm. And is he kind of saying, I need, he, he needed to kind of, his manhood kind of had to die and then learn from the women how to balance his manhood with his softer side. Okay. And you're all, you're all familiar, obviously, through Robert's work with the red, the black, and the white stages. Yeah the initiatory stages, and this, without, without any kind of difficulty, we can see this is a move from the red profoundly into the black. And it's the black that he carries to his relationship. This is the difference. He is no longer dancing with a deity. He's dancing with a real woman. And as some will, some will say, maybe all women have the toe bone and the tooth of a goddess, but that's all. And let's not get confused. And I think he shows a little bit of genius when he says, I suspect you are not a real woman. And she immediately becomes a duck. Uh, so there's a, this happens also in Tristan and Isolde. If you know that story, this is, there's the, there are two Isolde's in it. And are you going to get caught really with a, a feeling that is essentially religious? And I mean that in the best sense of the word, religio, to link back. A religious impulse and try and live that through a flesh and blood woman because it cannot work. Uh, and so her emerging and him coming to her as a scarecrow, not full of grandeur, but as a scarecrow, I think is extraordinary. And, and she gives him a bow, of course, that can't work. It's, fucking, it's a wonderful tricks the moment. It's a backwards moment. It's a smoky bow. What on earth is a smoky bow? Uh, and, a, and a twisted arrow. But he's at the right stage in his life for that all to, to come. Danny, you referenced you know, as, a, as a youth he, he had that moment. I, I could be a great I could be a great hunter. Mm. And he and he did become one. Mm. Blind. Crooked arrow, smoky bow, mm. luck shot. Mm. What greater hunter mm. is there than that? But it didn't look at all like what he thought it was gonna look like mm. when he was that kid. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, so, there's, there's no luck there's no luck in that shot. No. I remember somebody once saying to me that becoming an adult is partially the giving up of the addiction for excitement. Uh, never, never, never. Well, you said it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> he said it. <laughs> uh, yeah. But there is some, something in there that I find very attractive. There's a certain amount of acceptance that I feel mm. that he's, he's gone through change mm. and has acceptance mm. and humility. Mm. Is older. Yeah. 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 The problem is, is if you feel your whole life you've been a scarecrow and you have no memory of, the, of, the, of that gold, you have no memory of that time. Uh, the story is also pointing, I'm sure you feel, the fact that initiation is never a one-time deal. We are going to re-enter that forest a hundred times over from many different angles. Sorry, go at the back. Yeah, I, yeah um, I, I have a thought on the smoky bow. Um, yeah. To me, it sounds like a bow that's been sitting above the mantle place for mm. decades. It's been sitting there, uh, mm. ignored, uh, or certainly not used, waiting for, waiting for somebody to come who can actually handle it. It reminds me of Odysseus' bow. Sure. Uh, he comes back to the Great Hall. He hasn't been there in 20 years. It's been sitting there waiting for him, and there are all these other men who want to take his place and want his wife and palace and want to kill him. And he basically gives them the chance if they can string that bow mm. and not one of them can do it. This seems like the same bow to me. Yeah, but interesting. Mm. Just, for, just for a second, uh, if we could see the listener on a societal level. So I just wrote this back. Societally, one could argue that we are blind and that we seek vision but have we listened well and long enough to the earth to hunt the animals of inspiration that will bring us new eyes, that will bring us new vision? Because somewhere in, in the kernels of all of this, his status needs to be reduced, but at the same time, he is reaching back to that time in the forest. And I'm just worried about what happens to us when we don't have that impacted DNA information. It's clear we're seeking vision. Even fucking CEOs of, of companies that have been raping this earth for hundreds of years are trying to seek vision because even they know the numbers up. But have we listened well and long enough to the earth itself to hunt the animals of inspiration that will bring us new eyes? 
The buckskin blanket pulls seeing from humans and throws them into darkness. Some find eyes, many don't. What does a false vision look like? Is the buckskin blanket an object of truth, forcing us to go deeper? What do you say, Maladoma? Can you balance this perspective with uh, an indigenous perspective, a land-based perspective? <coughs> really, we've got to understand here, there's been an ongoing transformational uh, process in this story that uh, invoked what... Uh, Dagara people will call cosmologically the nature. Nature is at work here. And uh, magic is in effect. And more importantly, initiation. And so for me, I'm just looking at an initiation story. The thing about initiation is that it does not promise success. You enter initiation knowing that the only way is the way forward. As they say in, uh, among elders, the, you go forward, you die. You go backward, you die. So hell, go forward and die. <laughs> and so he is going in that direction. And so we got we to gotta see that more often than not, the grandiose, colorful ways in which we, we, we see transformation, we, we see our journey. Although it's not illegitimate, uh, because that's a teaser mm. to get us in mm. and then change the rule. Uh, uh, and so it's good to see it that bright so that you can jump in. Yeah. Because if you see it the way it is going to lead to blindness, crooked arrow and shit, you know. Why get into something like this? Uh, but that's what the magic of uh, transformation uh, contains. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, there's a bit of a, uh, there's, there's a bit of the, uh, the magic of a lie that uh, is involved in this process. And uh, it seems as if uh, we have, indeed, to use some, some unlikely fuel from some unlikely sources in order to merit or to deserve the sudden boomerang of a transformation we were not informed about. You know. Knowing everything before you get into it, dilute the whole thing into impossibilities. I remember myself 30 years ago, if I'd known that the initiation I went through was gonna be like that, I don't think I would. <laughs> no, no. You know, I invoke my right to choose. Uh, but uh, in rear view mirror, it looks like no, actually, uh, there's some moment, I don't, I don't know whether you use the word ignorance, mm. but not knowing mm. is our salvation, mm. really. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Danny. I just want to um, say something about uh, this calamity that befalls him, because I see it as a course correction. And it's a merciful thing. And uh, I don't know about you, but I've experienced that, where some horrible thing happens, and uh, it, it's, a, it's finding the blessing in the curse. But uh, this young man set out and was chosen to be the listener. And he got farther and farther and farther away from that. And what better thing to bring him back to listening than to take away his eyes? And now he truly becomes the listener. Mm -hmm. For the first time, mm -hmm. he is now the listener. Yeah. Deprivation and crookedness have started the process of this new vision. Deprivation and crookedness. 
It's a very strange thing. And also, I think it's worth taking away the idea of it's not the simple process of finding a new pair of eyes and that's it, you're fine. Those, that vision, again, will start to dim and you have to go through the thing over and over again. You have to go back out into the forest with your fading vision, fire your crooked bow in some crazy angle and hope it hits something. Hope that you're attuned to whatever it's trying to hit. But I'm fascinated by these different animals that come and lay down their lives for him. <laughs>